this feeling that something was terribly wrong with the world that we live in, but you couldn't figure out just what it was. Then you've come to the right place. Secret societies, mystery religions, and the Illuminati have been controlling our reality since the beginning of time. But not anymore, because there is an awakening happening, and you are about to become a part of it. The faith of our fathers became reality when a miraculous event took place 2,000 years ago when a baby boy was born to a young girl named Mary in the tiny town of Bethlehem in Palestine. Yet many centuries before the birth of Jesus Christ, the patriarchs of the Old Testament knew and believed in a deity, Jehovah or Yahweh, the Lord of the created universe. If we could condense those early years into a narrow space of time, we would see vast numbers of people, despite intense persecution from the authorities, becoming believers in the precepts of Jesus the Christ, the boy born to be king. Such a powerful, unbreakable hold did this newfound belief have upon the followers of the way, as the first Christians were named, that the teachings of Jesus spread outwards from the land of origin like ripples in all directions, like shock waves right through the Roman Empire, across Europe, and as far as the Britannic Isles. I am E. Raymond Capt, biblical archaeologist and historian. The Bible states, I am Alpha and Omega, saith the Lord. I know the beginning and I know the ending. Thus, Almighty God foreknew the trials and tribulations these first Christians would have to undergo as the faith spread to all the peoples of the earth. What was needed was a special group of people set apart to demonstrate to the uncaring world the benefits of following the rules and regulations issued forth from the grand design which would ensure harmonious living among the many divergent races and peoples of the planet. There is much evidence to show that many well-known names from the New Testament arrived in the south of France in the first century AD in order to establish small Christian missions and communities northwards along the valley of the Rhone River. Centuries before St. Augustine brought Romanized Christianity to Britain, the faith of Christ had arrived in the British Isles by way of the Mediterranean and France along the old trade routes pioneered by the enterprising Phoenicians. This is Glastonbury Abbey in the west of England. There is much tradition, indeed evidence, to indicate that Joseph of Arimathea at the command of St. Philip, the apostle to the Franks, brought the faith of our fathers to this remote corner of Europe in the first half of the first century AD and established the very first Christian church and community here. And did those feet in ancient time walk upon England's pastures green? So wrote the poet William Blake. And more than one ancient writer confirms what many now believe that Jesus himself lived for a time here during the 18 missing years in the biblical account of his ministry. Thus, many centuries after the establishment of the light-bearing nation of Israel in Palestine, the faith of Christ came to the Britannic Isles, where it secured an uncertain hold for the first years. 
until the Emperor Constantine declared Christianity to be the official religion of the Roman Empire. Britannia being then part of the empire until Rome departed in 410. Many of the ancient writers of that time confirmed that Britain was the first to receive the light of Christ. Through many centuries, the Christian faith spread slowly, and at times it flickered low. But time after time, it revived to illuminate the lives of the Celto-Saxon people, some of whom knew of their ancient Israelitish origin. In the 16th century, the light of the gospel of Christ again moved westward, away from the British Isles which had nourished it, to a new land across the ocean, to be placed anew in the wilderness. For it would seem that there was this innate desire in the 15th century to travel and explore westwards. Long before Sir Francis Drake cruised up the California coastline, John Cabot, in his little ship, Matthew, set sail from Bristol, England in 1497 to seek out a passage to the Indies. A replica of his craft and many other ships in sail gathered in the summer of 1996 in Bristol docks, from whence in later years sailed many other westbound explorers, all following the setting sun, eager to open up trade with the new world. Although the story of the Pilgrim Fathers is so well known in the United States of America, not so familiar is the story of the first English colony which sought a toehold in the wild, uncharted forests of Virginia. 13 years before the Pilgrim Fathers arrived in 1620. Even less is known about the English origin of the tiny settlement on the James River, which became known as Jamestown in honor of the English King James. On the 9th of January, 1580, there was a baptism of a baby boy in the little village of Willoughby in the county of Lincolnshire, England a boy in whose hands was to lie the future destiny of the United States of America. In Willoughby Parish Church South Window is the baby's name, John, son of George Smith, a tenant farmer on the estate of Lord Willoughby. John Smith, or Captain John Smith, as he later became known, is perhaps more familiar to the people of the United States than to the British, although there is a fine statue of him in the city of London. Even at school, John Smith decided to sell his books and go to sea. He states, I was determined to venture adventure. After a series of exciting adventures in Europe and Asia, Smith became a soldier of fortune. And later, he attached himself to a group interested in settling a colony in North America. When a royal charter was granted to this group, the Virginia Company, Smith was chosen as one of the leaders of the band of about 100 settlers who set sail from London in December 1606. In 1584, Sir Walter Riley examined the coast of Virginia for a possible site for a settlement. After checking Roanoke Island, reported that it was a most fertile and pleasant ground. Encouraged by this and determined that a colony should take root in Virginia, 108 colonists left Plymouth, England in 1585 under the command of Sir Richard Grenville. On their arrival, their first priority was self-protection and a fort was constructed. The settlers had secured a toll, but life turned out to be even harder than they imagined Food shortages, disease, harsh weather, and attacks by local Indians discouraged many of the settlers. And although Sir Francis Drake pleaded with them to hold out, the majority favored leaving. Thus, in 1586, Drake took the settlers back to England, leaving only a few on Roanoke. Back in Europe, war with Spain was imminent. The Spaniards had assembled the greatest fleet ever for the invasion of England. Every available ship was needed for the defense of Britain. Thus, the little company on Rueno Island was left to look after itself. In 1588, a combination of violent storms and the skill of the English sea captains decimated the armada. 
Giving the glory to God, Queen Elizabeth had struck the Armada medal on which she had inscribed. He blew, and they were scattered. When Governor White was at long last able to return to Virginia, he found no trace of the garrison. They had vanished. A message found on a tree at the ruined settlement indicated that the colonists may have moved to Crototon Island. But the mystery of what became of the colony has never been satisfactorily explained. Not until a further 17 years had passed did three ships with John Smith aboard start their epic voyage. In St. Stephen's Church in the city of London, stained glass windows depict the three tiny ships that took the first Englishman to Jamestown. And a brass plaque in the church tells the story of Captain John Smith, whose firm leadership took control of a demoralized community at a time of crisis. The three ships were the Susan Constant, of 140 tons, the Godspeed of 40 tons, and the Discovery of 20 tons. Discovery was not much larger than an inshore fishing boat. The three ships of the Virginia Company made landfall on this somewhat exposed shore of what is now Cape Henry. These were frail craft indeed for such a journey, and prayers of thankfulness for a safe arrival were offered up. A simple wooden cross was put up, and this stone one has been placed at Cape Henry to mark the spot. On it is written, here at Cape Henry, first landed in America upon the 26th of April, 1607, those English colonists who upon the 13th of May, 1607, established at Jamestown the first permanent English settlement in America. As a grim forewarning of what might lie ahead, Indians attacked the landing party on that first day, and two of the settlers were wounded. But Cape Henry was far too exposed to be of any practical use, and the three ships proceeded up the James River. Here they found water deep enough to secure the ships to the trees on the bank. Today, replicas of the three ships lie alongside the jetty at Jamestown, where they can be boarded and inspected by visitors to the settlement. Protection against Indian attack was in the shape of a triangular fort, with cannons covering every likely line of approach, and a massive fence or palisade was erected to keep out not only marauding Indians, but wild animals as well. Dwelling houses and stores were placed in the center. A church was built, which also served as a community meeting place. The pews were hard, but they helped to keep the congregation awake during the sermons, which could be quite lengthy. On that first Sunday ashore, the settlers received Holy Communion from the Reverend Hunt beneath a rough canopy made from one of the ship's sails. Later, a more substantial church was built, of which only tower remains today. The Reverend Hunt, chaplain to the colonists, had been the vicar of an easy living in the Sussex village of Heathfield and had been nominated by Bishop Hackcutt as pastor to the expedition. A stained glass window in the church depicts him and the other main characters in the story of this first English colony in the New World. The Red Indian chief, Powhatan, looks uncertainly at John Smith, who in this picture has trustingly turned his back to him.
and the Reverend Hunt is shown with the communion cup. These first colonists were by no means all imbued with high ideals, and only some were Christian. They were a very mixed bag. Even their first president, Wingfield, was found to be hoarding food, and he was speedily deposed in favor of Captain Smith. Smith strengthened defenses, enforced firm but not rigid discipline, and encouraged settlers to grow their own produce. He comes through as a sound strategist in dealing with the Indians, and as a far-sighted leader who knew that discipline is the key to accomplishments. He organized an efficient guard room with weapons and ammunition in well-ordered rows, everything ready for instant action should the need arise. Being of an adventurous nature, on one occasion Smith went too far upriver and was caught by an Indian hunting party and was taken prisoner to the Indian village, ruled over by Chief Powhatan. His coat, Smith later stated, became a pincushion of arrows, which doesn't say much for the penetrating power of Indian arrows. The Indians, as they were called at that time, constructed their dwellings of flexible withies, bent over and secured at the top, with the sides of the huts made from interwoven branches. How about grilled fish for supper? With no shortage of animals in the Virginian forest, the indigenous population was never short of skins for rugs and cloaks. Clay from the nearby river provided adequate everyday pottery for cooking purposes. Smith was sentenced to death, but according to his own account of the event, Pocahontas, the chief's daughter, intervened and his life was spared. Later, a somewhat imaginative painting was made of this dramatic moment. Pocahontas had often played near the settlement as a child, and later in life she became the first Indian to accept the Christian faith and be baptized. A stained glass window in St. George's Church, Gravesend, done in Victorian style, shows her baptism. But the original ceremony would have been much simpler. Had this been a romantic story, Pocahontas would surely have married John Smith, but in fact she married John Rolfe, who introduced the growing of tobacco, which put the Jamestown economy on a firm footing as the flavor of Virginia tobacco was much sought after in England. Glass making was attempted on a small scale, but was only of use locally as the quality of the glass was poor. With her father's somewhat unwilling blessings, Roth brought Pocahontas to England, a voyage she much enjoyed. The Roth family lived in a manor house at Hesham, Norfolk. And here, Pocahontas produced a son, Thomas. The village of Heatham has a signboard commemorating the Indian princess and shows her in her court dress. She was presented to the king at the royal court, where she made a great impression with her quiet and dignified manner. The romantic charm of the Pocahontas story inspired one artist to create a statue of her reclining, admiring a flower which she holds in her hands. Unhappily, prior to her return to Virginia, she contracted a severe illness, possibly pneumonia, and she died aboard the ship Gravesend on the River Thames. She was taken ashore and was interred somewhere in the graveyard of St. George's Church, but the exact site has now been lost. A fine bronze statue of her unveiled by Governor Battle of Virginia, stands in the grounds of the church. 
an identical statue of the Indian princes stands in the settlement at Jamestown. Perhaps it was the influence of Pocahontas. Perhaps it was the brotherly attitude of some of the Christian settlers. But at a time when the little colony was near starvation, the Indians showed another side from their occasional savagery. The record keeper of the settlement wrote, But now was all our provisions spent, the sturgeon gone, all help abandoned. Each hour expecting the fury of the savages when Almighty God changed the hearts of the Indians so that they brought us such plenty of their fruits that no man wanted. But when it was discovered that rats had destroyed their small store of grain, it was decided to abandon Jamestown. But as they sailed away downriver, they met up with the relief ships arriving, and thus with much rejoicing, they all returned to Jamestown. On such small events hung the fate of the colony. In order to strengthen and expand the little colony, the Virginia Company advertised for adventurous young women to embark upon a new life in the new world. Many volunteered, tired perhaps of their mundane life in the quiet English villages. There is no doubt that the young men of Virginia were glad of this addition to the community. Thus, the arrivals were even given an armed escort, either to protect the young women or to keep in check the potential husbands. In 1619, the first representative assembly was held in the old church, and this was the beginning of the present legislative government of the United States. Jamestown was established close to the James River, so the community built their town close to where the ships lay. But the area was low-lying and somewhat unhealthy. Thus, after about 90 years of constant setbacks, disease, Indian attacks, and a series of disastrous fires, a series of communal prayer meetings was held, and it was decided to move to higher ground. Williamsburg became the principal seat of religion, education, society, commerce, and fashion, and Jamestown gradually withered away. The names of Williamsburg residents and visitors are well known in American history. George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Patrick Henry, George Mason, and many others. For the town also became the seat of rebellion. Here, delegates were instructed to initiate a Declaration of Independence. And here, Mason's Declaration of Rights was adopted. And here, Virginia's state constitution was framed. Had it not been for the courage and wise leadership of Captain John Smith, this first foothold on the soil of the New World might never have happened at this place, nor at this time. Surely this was the hand of destiny? No, not destiny. It was the hand of Almighty God who had prepared a place for the pre-planned expansion westward of the Celto-Saxon people, bringing the Bible that most precious thing that this world affords, from the old world to the new. It came with the Pilgrim Fathers, who had separated themselves from the soulless formalities of the Church of England, which they viewed as a puddle of corruption, and after 12 years of self-imposed exile in Holland, finally departed from the shores of England for a place in which they could serve and worship God, untrampled by the formalities of orthodoxy. Although not adverse to seeking wealth and possible trade concessions in the New World, religion was the prime cause which brought the Pilgrim Fathers to America, this westward migration being part of the Reformation movement. Being led by God, as Israel always has been, led, not driven, the little band of pilgrims left from Plymouth in the west of England from Plymouth Harbor, now a tourist location. especially for Americans. The voyage in Mayflower in its later stages became very rough and conditions below decks were far from pleasant. Yet this little band sang and praised God with a faith burning in their souls, knowing that they were being led to the land of God's promise.
they call themselves, the seed of Abraham, God's servants, his chosen, the children of Jacob. Written in their own records, they call themselves a vine out of Egypt, grafted into this wilderness. Well, God moved in many mysterious ways to lay the background for the coming of the Pilgrim Fathers to these shores. As they approached the long arm of Cape Cod, God's hand was over them. For that part of New England's coastline is a maze of treacherous reefs. Safely navigating these hazards, they came ashore in the cold and stormy month of November, 1620, where today is the town of Plymouth, Massachusetts. In Mayflower's stuffy main cabin, on the 11th of November, 1620, they grew up a compact, the Mayflower Compact, a distinct and solemn document which was to give birth to a nation of free peoples. This was the beginning of government by law and by which all the 41 men present voluntarily agreed to obey all the laws passed for the general welfare and good of the colony. This was destined to foreshadow the great heritage of freedom that Americans have enjoyed for so long. The fathers who planted this nation that day were Christians. They came as Christians. They came because they were Christians, coming on a civic Christian venture. This plantation which determined the future of the nation was a church, not a town, not a colony, not a trading or exploration venture, not a gold rush, but a church. A little Christian church had crossed the Atlantic Ocean for the sake of its church life. This was the true origin of the United States of America. As a reminder of this historic occasion, a reconstruction of the original Mayflower sailed across the Atlantic, lies at anchor in Plymouth Harbor. The spirit of the Christian faith burning within the hearts of the fathers can be seen in the words of the Mayflower Compact. For it opened with these words. In the name of God, amen. We whose names are underwritten, having undertaken for the glory of God and the advancement of the Christian faith, a voyage to plant the first colony in the northern parts of Virginia, do by these presents solemnly and mutually in the presence of God and one another, covenant and combine ourselves into a civic body politic. On January 21st, 1621, the pilgrims held their first religious services on American soil in their newly completed common house, the first building they put up at Plymouth. The original 20-foot square thatched building probably bore little resemblance to this structure painted by a 19th century artist. The arrival of the pilgrims in New England and the establishment of the Plymouth colony and the celebration of that first Thanksgiving is remembered by every schoolchild. While these incidents were important to the future nation, there were lesser known but perhaps more important lessons to be learned from the Plymouth experience. The first, that these New World settlers learned that no matter how godly a group is, as long as any of the carnal nature remains unchanged, a civil government is necessary. Since the pilgrims landed north of the jurisdiction of the Virginia Company, and the Mayflower carried strangers as well as saints, it became necessary to establish a form of government for their party. A second lesson was learned, that of unusual blessings obtained by walking in obedience to God's laws. And this was soon apparent to the pilgrims. In response to his promise, God revealed his mighty workings on their behalf. A nearby tribe of Indians, wiped out by plague, left their store of grain untouched at a time when the settlers were nearest to starvation. Not only this, but two Indians, Samoset and Squanto, who to the astonishment of the pilgrims could speak English. They willingly instructed the colony how to exist in the wilderness. 
It is a mistake to think that there were continual war between the settlers and the Indians. This is the Indian Chief Massot, who signed a peace treaty with the Pilgrims in 1621, a treaty faithfully observed for 54 years. However, the Indians neglected to warn the settlers about the location of some of the local deer traps, and Governor Bradford had his foot caught in one of them, to the considerable discomfiture and the merriment of the colonists. But there was a third lesson to be learned, that the principles of communism, seemingly workable in theory, do not work in real life, and this they learnt at the cost of much suffering and hardship. According to the rules of the Virginia Company, each producer was to contribute the results of his or her labors into a common storehouse, and was then to draw out what might be needed. However, this system never allows for the frailty of human nature, and such rules were partly responsible for the failure of the system in Jamestown. It was only after each family was permitted to cultivate its own small plot of ground and make a garden that the settlers began to prosper. As we now know only too well, a government dole, regardless of production schedules, kills incentive and personal initiative. The Mayflower Compact not only had an effect on the lives of the early settlers, but later also on the 13 colonies, in these words. Whereas we all came into these parts of America with one and the same end, namely to advance the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ and to enjoy the liberties of the gospel in purity, we therefore concede it is our bounden duty that, as in nation and religion, so in other respects we be and continue one. The charters of all 50 states carry religious language and acknowledge their foundations in God. But some elements of today's society seem deathly scared of anything religious and seem totally ignorant that Christians gave America the very moral fabric upon which this nation has prospered. By the close of the 1870s, a second great movement of God's people took place. Thousands of colonial Americans, until then mostly clustered along the eastern seaboard, began to pull up roots and head out west, partly perhaps in obedience to the instincts working half blindly in their minds. They set out to make homes for their children in the wilderness. It was the fur trappers and traders who blazed the trails that the pioneers were to follow. These pathfinders were called mountain men. They were always restless and fearless, always interested in what lay over the next horizon. They explored uncharted mountains and forded icy streams in search of beaver fur and skins, and took pride in the name mountain men. Sometimes they traveled in groups, sometimes alone. One such man, Jedekiah Strong Smith, of New Hampshire Methodist stock, at the age of 23, with a butcher's knife in his belt and a Bible in his bedroll, entered the Rocky Mountain fur trade in 1822. Two years later, he explored the Wind River and discovered the South Pass, thus opening up a way through to the West. In 1843, the historian Jesse Applegate wrote about these pioneers. They traversed trackless wastes wide and deep rivers, rugged and lofty mountains, and beset by hostile savages. Yet they were always found ready and equal to the occasion. May we not call them men of destiny? This westward intrusion through what had been for centuries Indian lands was met with predictable hostile attacks. 
Inter-tribal warfare had made the Indian tribes skillful fighters, and many were armed with rifles obtained from the traders. These attacks on the wagon trains resulted in much loss of life, both Indian and pioneer. But this westward trek contained people of grit and determination, democratic in spirit, fierce in battle, and ever eager to cross the next range, cross the next river, and conquered whatever challenges the unknown might possess. They were led by an invisible hand, and the divine hand of providence could not be halted. They were part of an unfolding saga of events that shaped this nation. Many Christian ministers dared to leave the comfort of their own churches to join the wagon trains heading west. They felt the urge to spread the gospel far and wide and knew they had to go where the people went. On the trail, they preached, buried the dead, and taught hymn singing. They sometimes carried their pulpits and a stock of Bibles with them. Francis Asbury, a Methodist circuit rider, roamed the wilderness on horseback through all kinds of weather to search out pioneers who needed to hear the gospel and Christians who needed encouragement. He is said to have traveled over a quarter of a million miles and preached more than 25,000 sermons. He planted the gospel everywhere like a spiritual Johnny Appleseed. As the pioneers moved west, they established new towns, usually consisting of a store where settlers could buy grain, clothing, and a few tools, a blacksmith shop, a sawmill, a grist mill, a hotel, and several homes. Next came a community meeting hall, also used as a schoolroom and for church services on worship days until a proper church could be built. Although the West was not without thieves, murders, and carnal sin, churches grew in number, and revival meetings had a profound effect in transforming the lives and morals of Western society. The impact of the gospel was evident in the laws that were written, in individual lives, and the blessings that followed by honoring the God who granted their blessings and freedom. Clearly, our forefathers put their trust in God, and they continually acknowledged that God had made and preserved the nation. It was not lightly that they chose to have the words liberty in God we trust placed on every coin minted in the United States. In our Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States, we clearly state, one nation under God. Our National Cathedral in Washington, also known as the Cathedral of St. Peter and St. Paul, stands as a house of prayer for the people of our nation, built to reflect the overruling majesty of God upon the whole nation. First conceived by George Washington as a church for national purposes, it was not until 1893 that Congress granted a charter to the Protestant Episcopal Cathedral Foundation to establish and maintain within the District of Columbia a cathedral for the promotion of religion, education, and charity. Built in pure 14th century Gothic style, no internal skeleton of structural steel was used. They used the same methods that were used by medieval stone masons, stone upon stone, which resulted in the fifth largest cathedral in the world. The altar is known as the Jerusalem altar, constructed of stone from King Solomon's quarries below Jerusalem city. The talents of artisans, sculptures in stone, artisans in stained glass, have produced this magnificent witness to our reliance and faith in God's grace upon America. Our Constitution was designed to perpetuate a Christian order. Why then is there in the main an absence of any reference to Christianity or God's laws? because the framers of the Constitution did not believe that this was an area of jurisdiction for the federal government. They did not want to reestablish that which the colonists had fought against, that is, religious control and authority by the central government. 
But to those who hold that the United States was not created as a Christian nation, this is what the Supreme Court of the Church of the Holy Trinity wrote in 1892. Our laws and institutions must necessarily be based upon and embody the teachings of the Redeemer of mankind. It is impossible that it should be otherwise. And in this sense, and to this extent, our civilization and our institutions are emphatically Christian. This is a religious people. This is historically true. From the discovery of this continent to the present hour, there is but one single voice making this affirmation. We find everywhere a clear recognition of this same truth. These and many other matters which might be noticed add a volume of unofficial declarations to the mass of organic utterances that this is a Christian nation. Our founding fathers believed that America had been chosen providentially for a special destiny. Thomas Jefferson wrote, I shall need the favor of that being in whose hands we are, who led our fathers of, as Israel of old from their native land and planted them in a country flowing with all the necessaries and comforts of life. If there is any doubt that the original founders of this nation were God-fearing people, one has only to read what they wrote when touched by some moment of spiritual clarity. For the support of this declaration with a firm reliance upon the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our honor. All the good from the Savior of this world is communicated through the Bible. And for this book, we could not know right from wrong. All the things desirable to man are contained within it. The first and almost the only book deserving of universal attention is the Bible. We have staked the whole future of American civilization according to the Ten Commandments of God. Go to the Scriptures. The joyful promises it contains will be a balsam to all your troubles. Whatever makes men good Christians also makes them good citizens. Direct my thoughts, words, and works. Wash away my sins in the immaculate blood of the Lamb. And daily frame me more and more into the likeness of thy Son, Jesus Christ. Our pilgrim fathers expressed the same reliance and faith in God in the words of the Mayflower Compact, and that same faith is inscribed in the design of America's great seal, which depicts in symbolic manner the principles which inspired the founders of our republic. The new nation needed international acceptance, thus to emphasize its authority, needed a national seal to be affixed to each and every official document. This was the design which was finally accepted. The main theme is a bald eagle with a cluster of 13 stars in a glory cloud over its head. From its beak there flutters a scroll bearing a motto composed of 13 letters, E Pluribus Unum, meaning one out of many. In its right talent is an olive branch with 13 leaves and 13 berries, symbolizing peace. And in its left talent are 13 arrows, each fleshed with 13 feathers, symbolic of the awful force which could be released by the United States should it ever become necessary. On the reverse side of the seal is the design on the left side of a $1 bill, an unfinished pyramid surmounted by an all-seeing eye of God. The eye within the triangular capstone symbolizes the watchful eye of the God of the Bible, watching over the destiny of this nation and illustrates those prophetic words, Behold, he that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. 
This ancient symbol of Israel was used by Jethro, the father-in-law of Moses, centuries before it was adopted and perverted with satanic overtones by the Illuminati of Germany and France. In like manner, the six-pointed star, or shield of David, was used by the ancient Hebrew people centuries before being adopted by modern Judaism and the Israeli state. The 13 stars not only represent the original 13 colonies, but also the coming together of the whole house of Israel in America. Above the I in Latin is Anuit Septus, meaning he, God, has favored our undertakings. Beneath the pyramid are the words, Novus Ordo Seclorum. We are the new order of the ages, and the date 1776. However, this model should not be confused with the so-called new world order, in which Almighty God is very conspicuously absent. Together, the two sides represent the coat of arms of the United States, and bear in mind that such designs, be they of a family or of a nation, are never taken lightly. Much thought is given to every detail, the origins of which go back in time many generations, the hopes of the future, ancient beginnings, traditions, and history all play a part in its design. The great seal of the United States is no exception. Its emblazoned illustrations bristle with symbolic significance. It is important that Americans recognize this symbolism and understand that its insignia was not evolved by chance. Symbolism expresses an idea pictorially. Jesus Christ himself taught by using symbols. As the scripture states, without a parable or a symbol spake he not unto them. So it is that the eagle is the ancient symbol of spiritual vision. It was traditionally supposed to be the only creature that could look directly into the sun. In the great seal, it represents the people of the United States. The Bible often refers to the eagle, its piercing eye, its courage, and its swiftness of flight. The book of Job refers to the inaccessibility of its nest and the remarkable care it shows in guarding its young. In times of danger, the parent bird can carry its young on its back to safety, reminding us how God took the Hebrews out of Egypt and bore them on eagles' wings. St. John speaks of Israel symbolized as a woman fleeing into the wilderness on two wings of a great eagle. Thus, the great seal symbolizes Israel's escape from bondage in Egypt to a place of wide horizons and freedom, set apart under the express favor of divine protection. It is not too great a stretch of faith to believe that this vast country was left desolate and set apart for our people to inhabit in the latter days. The shield on the great seal displays 13 red and white paleways, to use heraldic terms, representing our 13 original colonies. A band of blue at the top uniting the paleways represents Congress. The sons of Jacob Israel have ever been famed for their prowess with a long bow. And the prophet Jeremiah described Israel as God's battle axe and weapon of war. And so the arrows of the Almighty, with a little help from the United States military, protects this nation and help to ensure the continuation of world peace. It is very significant that the Lord God of Israel said to Manasseh, the 13th tribe of Israel, I am thy shield. No nation on earth is so all pervaded with this number 13. We see it occurring again and again in the heraldry of the Manasseh America. 
Joseph's father Jacob, surnamed Israel, adopted Joseph's two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, creating two extra tribes. In blessing them, Israel was placed his right hand on the head of the younger boy, Ephraim. Thus he took Joseph's place and became the eleventh tribe, leaving Manasseh, the older boy, coming in the list of tribes after Benjamin, to become thirteenth. However, of the twelve sons of Israel, the priestly tribe of Levi was not included in the numbering. Thus the Bible continues to speak of the twelve tribes, not the thirteen. On the base of the Great Seals Pyramid is the date 1776, which was not only the date of the founding of our nation, but it was also the ending of a prophetic time period known as the Seven Times, or a period of 2,520 years. This period was a warning to the house of Israel that if the people persisted in their evil ways and ignored God's divine laws, they would be removed from their land for that same period of time. 2,520 years back in time brings us to the date of 745 B.C., the year the forces of Assyria first attacked the tribal area occupied by the people of Manasseh and carried them away captive into Assyria, placing them in Hala, Hebar, Gozan, and also in Media, according to the, to the Book of Kings. Due to recent archaeological discoveries, the people of Israel, now far from being a subservient captive people, migrated westward under different names, Cimmerians, Simbri, Scythians, Gauls, Normans, and Saxons, to settle in Western Europe, Scandinavia, and the British Isles. And it was from these areas at the start of the 17th century there came the first colonists to America, the vanguard of a subsequent flood of settlers in fulfillment of God's promise to Abraham that his descendants would spread abroad to the east, the west, the north, and the south. The irrefutable evidence is that Caucasian America represents Manasseh, who became one out of many. Israel regathered into this vast wilderness, prepared for them by Almighty God and his foreknowledge of things to come. Although lost to their identity, as was foretold by the Apostle Paul, who wrote, blindness in part has happened to Israel, and even to this day the people of Israel are still blind to their real identity. Further evidence showing that America represents Manasseh is found in the writings of the prophet Jeremiah. Their nobles shall be of themselves, and their governors shall proceed from the midst of them. What this means is, a nation of the people, by the people, and for the people. A nation in which the people are supreme, a republic. Sadly, America has in many ways neglected its birthright and has rejected God from its affairs. The humanist approach being emphasized in many walks of life today. But we are told in simple language what we must do. The New Testament makes it abundantly clear. If my people, which are called by my name, that is the Christian community, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and will heal their land. Let us therefore give ear to that call, arise, shine, that the glory of the Lord may through us be made manifest to all peoples and nations, and that by our example they may come to know and understand the blessings of righteousness. This is the mission and purpose of Israel. God having chosen us the descendants of ancient Israel, to be a channel for a blessing of all mankind, and in doing so, show forth his praise. This nation under God awaits the chief cornerstone, symbolized by Jesus Christ, a stone rejected by the builders, which has not yet been set in place in the nation's consciousness. Today, as in the days of the Pilgrim Fathers, the chief cornerstone still hovers over the country's great seal insignia, floating in glory, as if awaiting the time when it might descend to complete our national structure with a divine completion, God's new order of the ages, which is the coming kingdom of God on earth.